You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's a big, it works on so many levels. I know. I thought it was a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, weekly art history for all ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood. Today, we're entering the semifinals in this year's Arts Madness Tournament. We started with 64 diverse artists, and every week, you all have voted, cutting the field in half four times. We now have the final four pitting Hokusai's Great Wave up against the Taj Mahal. And Van Gogh's Starry Night is facing off against Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, each trying to earn their spot in the semifinals. Be sure to keep voting for your favorites at whoartedpodcast.com slash vote. Also, I have it linked in the show notes. For today's episode, I wanted to talk a bit about Mondrian, neoplasticism, and a funny story about a mistake with one of his works that went unnoticed for 75 years. I planned this Mondrian episode for today because I am extremely proud to say that my very first article for The Art of Education University is being published today. I've already mentioned that I recently began writing for The Art of Ed University's magazine, As someone who has learned a lot from the AOEU over the years, it is a dream come true to get to join their team. When I was applying for the job, my very first writing sample was a lesson idea focusing on Mondrian with some science connections. For all my fellow art teachers out there, head over to theartofeducation.edu and check out my article on a lesson idea building basic shapes into forms and see how easy it can be for kids to wire LED lights into their artwork with a little copper tape. It was one of my first original lesson plans I was proud to create back when I started teaching, and I cannot tell you what it means to me to be having my first published article for The Art of Ed. I'll include a link in the show notes for anyone who's interested. Now, on to the actual topic for today, Mondrian. Piet Mondrian, the Dutch abstract art pioneer, wasn't born reaching for the pure geometry of his later works. His artistic journey began in a much more traditional setting, shaped by family influence, the artistic and cultural currents of his time. He was born Pieter Cornelis Mondrian Jr. in 1872 in Amersfoort, Netherlands. His father was a drawing teacher and his uncle a painter. They fostered his artistic inclinations. Still, even with those artistic influences, his family had a strict Protestant background and they encouraged him to be a little bit more practical in his career path. At 14, he began studying drawing, but ultimately he obtained a teaching degree in 1892. He was qualified as a teacher, but Mondrian's passion lay in painting. He continued to hone his skills, taking lessons from a local painter near his family home in Winterswijk. During this period, he was creating naturalistic and a bit impressionistic style landscapes. I mean, impressionism was sort of the avant-garde of the late 19th century. It also reflected the influence of the Hague School, a Dutch movement known for depictions of rural life. While his artistic family obviously shaped his career, I think the family's religious beliefs were also important for understanding the man, his vision, and his work. Calvinism was a Protestant denomination emphasizing order and self-denial. This might have contributed to Piet's later interest in theosophy, a spiritual movement that resonated with his desire for a simplified universal order. So in 1892, determined to pursue his artistic dreams fully, Mondrian moved to Amsterdam. That was the heart of the Dutch art scene. He enrolled in Rijks Academy, the prestigious Academy of Fine Art. The Academy's curriculum was rooted in traditional techniques, but it exposed Mondrian to a variety of styles, including historical and contemporary European art movements. As I said, the early days of his painting style, we saw a lot of landscapes, a bit of that Hague School influence, as well as some Impressionistic and Post-Impressionistic influence. 
But as someone with a little bit of a spiritual bent to him, he also started grappling with symbolism, a movement that imbued everyday objects with deeper meanings. While these early paintings showed a developing talent, they lacked the revolutionary spirit that would define his later works. And yes, simple squares and rectangles in traditional primary colors were low-key revolutionary. A turning point came around 1908 when he began spending summers in Domburg, a seaside resort. Here, he encountered other progressive artists and became increasingly interested in theosophy, a spiritual movement that emphasized the unity of all things. The theosophy drew from ideas of different religious traditions, and it was intended to be very inclusive and welcoming of anyone seeking enlightenment and spiritual growth. These new influences began to nudge Mondrian towards abstraction. By the early 1910s, Mondrian started simplifying forms and reducing his color palette. He became particularly drawn to cubism, a movement that fragmented objects into simple geometric shapes and mixed perspectives. Cubism's focus on structure resonated with Mondrian's growing desire to express universal truths through basic forms. But Mondrian wasn't content with simply adopting cubism. He wanted to push the boundaries further, stripping away all representational elements to arrive at pure abstraction. This quest for artistic purity would eventually lead him to co-found Distill, which was the style, in 1917. It was a movement characterized by the use of horizontal and vertical lines, black, white, and primary colors. Amidst the turmoil of World War I, those Dutch artists and architects, including Piet Mondrian and Theo van Doesburg, sought to create a new artistic movement that reflected their utopian ideals. They envisioned art as a bridge between humanity and a higher order, a means to achieve balance and harmony through pure abstraction. This vision found its voice in Distill, a magazine launched by Van Dosberg that served as a platform for their artistic theories and creations. Distill artists believed in the power of simplicity and universality. I guess that's why they called it the style. It wasn't a style. It was the style. It was something that would be timeless and universal because it was just about these fundamental elements that would always be in style. They rejected the representation of the natural world, advocating for a visual language built on fundamental elements. Within Distill, Piet Mondrian emerged as a leading theoretician, developing a more rigorous artistic philosophy he called neoplasticism. Just to break down the terms there, neo means new, and plasticity is the ability of something to be shaped or molded. Building upon the core principles of Distill, Mondrian believed that art should transcend the limitations of the physical world, revealing a fundamental order and harmony that exists beyond appearances. He saw horizontal and vertical lines as representing the dynamic forces of the universe, while the primary colors embodied pure energy. Through his precise arrangements on the canvas, Mondrian aimed to achieve a state of dynamic equilibrium, a balance between opposing forces. The distill movement wasn't confined to painting, though. Its principles were applied to various artistic disciplines, including furniture design, architecture, and typography. Architects like Gerrit Reitveld translated the geometric forms and primary colors into iconic furniture pieces and even buildings like the Reitveld Schroeder House in Utrecht. Distill aimed to create a holistic aesthetic experience where art transcended the canvas and permeated the environment. Now, despite the effort to make this a timeless and universal style, Distill and neoplasticism actually had a relatively short lifespan, but they left a lasting impact on the development of modern art. 
Their emphasis on abstraction, geometry, primary colors resonated with artists across Europe and beyond. Movements like the Bauhaus, minimalism, owe a debt to Distill's pioneering spirit. And today, Distill and neoplasticism continue to inspire artists, designers, architects with their timeless pursuit of simplicity, harmony, and a universal visual language. I think as an art teacher, what I really love about it is in these movements, we can see sort of that pure abstraction and design principles at play. We can see the deliberate arrangement of those basic building blocks of art, and we can see the consequences of those choices. Like when I think of Mondrian's composition with red, blue, and yellow, we see a rather spare canvas with just a couple of um, squares and rectangles. It all feels very sort of calm and steady and and static compared to, say, Broadway Boogie Woogie, where he's using the same colors, the same shapes, the same elements, but there's so much repetition. It takes on this whole other rhythm and there's this more sort of frenetic tone. Now, after the break, I want to cover a bit more about Mondrian and a fun fact about a work of his that even museums were wrong about for 75 years. In 1940, Mondrian settled in New York. Like a lot of artists, he wanted nothing to do with World War II and fled Europe for America. While in New York, he associated with a number of up-and-coming artists in the growing abstract expressionist movement. Many of those young artists looked up to Mondrian, and I've read accounts indicating some saw him as a mentor of sorts. I always thought this association seemed a little odd as Mondrian's work was so neat and precise. The orderly squares and rectangles seemed so visually satisfying, making a lot of the pieces seem like they had arrived at a resting state. Abex, on the other hand, was so much about action painting, but these styles weren't so much standing in opposition to each other, but more like opposite sides of the same coin. They may have looked different, but had the same purpose, embracing pure abstraction and exploring ideas about the human condition through the basic elements of art. Mondrian thrived on the energy of the city. He was said to be a great dancer and loved the fast-paced boogie-woogie music that was playing in the hottest clubs of the day. While in New York, his style evolved. He began eliminating the black lines and colored shapes, instead using bands of colors overlapping, focusing on movement and energy in those lines. Piet Mondrian's New York City One became an artistic curiosity in 2022, not for its bold geometric composition, but for the revelation that it might have been hung upside down for decades. This seemingly simple error sparked discussions about artistic intention, curatorial responsibility, and the ever-evolving interpretation of art. The rectangles in New York City 1 vary in size and position. The asymmetry creates a sense of movement. While some interpret it as a literal depiction of the city's grid-like layout, others see it as a more abstract representation of the city's vibrant energy. The inclusion of a thicker band of black along one edge, which some believe represents the bottom of the composition, adds to the ambiguity. While preparing for a Piet Mondrian exhibition, the art historian Suzanne Meyer Bucer in Dusseldorf, Germany, made a startling discovery. Examining archival photographs, she noticed that a similar work by Mondrian, possibly an earlier version of New York City One, displayed the thicker black band at the top. This observation led her to believe that the museum's version had been displayed upside down for decades. The revelation of the potential error presented a significant dilemma for the museum. Mondrian was known to be meticulous, but he hadn't signed the work, possibly because it was unfinished. Without a definitive mark from the artists, the question of intention remained open. Adding to that, the upside-down presentation, 
while being unintentional, had become the accepted way to view the artwork for decades. And curators argued that the work had gained a life of its own, with its current orientation influencing interpretations and discussions about the piece. Additionally, the artwork, on loan from a private collection, was considered to be too fragile to risk damage by attempting to reverse it. Basically, the bands were like taped down, so um, the adhesive was a bit weak, and they worried that if they reoriented the piece, the the adhesive might give out, the bands might come off, and the piece would be damaged. The New York City One case sparked lively debates in the art world. While some called for correcting the display, others saw the upside-down perspective as a new way to appreciate the work's dynamism. The controversy highlighted the subjective nature of art interpretation and the role of curators in shaping our understandings of artworks. Ultimately, the museum decided to keep New York City One in its current orientation. This decision, while acknowledging the importance of artistic intention, gave a little bit more emphasis to the evolving history of the artwork's reception. New York City One serves as a reminder that art is not static. It can continue to surprise and spark discussion, as the artist may have one vision for a piece, but once it leaves the studio, the ultimate meaning, interpretation, and beauty of the work comes from the connection with the viewers. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.